So let me start the session 6-5, Space Race for the Battle Star, International Law Implications of the Militarization of Space. My name is Setsuka Aoki, Professor of Law at Keio University Law School, Tokyo, Japan. I'm the moderator of this panel. This panel is tasked with articulating present situation of military use of outer space, often also called militarization of space, and analyzing international law challenges it presents from international space law perspectives, and also exchanging views to what extent and how international humanitarian law is going to be applied once an armed conflict breaks out in outer space. Four distinguished speakers, panelists, are invited in front of you today, who are experts most suitable for this panel. Before introducing four distinguished panelists, I'm going to outline a few but important legally binding norms with respect to military uses of outer space as a starter. Then it is to be followed by the, the panelists, by them each presentation. These rules are. First, threat or use of threat or use of sorry threat or the use of force is prohibited, irrespective of the irrespective of the place under the United Nations Charter, and therefore threat or use of force in to and from outer space is prohibited. Second, any nuclear explosion is prohibited in accordance with the Partial Test Ban Treaty. Third. The Outer Space Treaty prohibits weapons of mass destruction from being placed in the orbit around the Earth or otherwise stationed in outer space. And also any military use of any military use of the, the celestial bodies other than the Earth is prohibited under the Outer Space Treaty. Further arms control in outer space has been discussed for several decades for various international fora, including especially conference on disarmament, without producing any non-legally binding rules, let alone legally binding rules. That is the situation we are now. And now I'm going to introduce four eminent panelists. Each panelist will speak about nine minutes on the specific subject relating to the use of outer space, military use of outer space. After the presentation, discussion will start and then wrap up. The first speaker is Major Amy Sfara. Major Sfara is currently serving Law Division, Operations and International Law Directorate, Office of the Judge Advocate General, Headquarters, United States Air Force. The division serves as a Judge Advocate General's primary liaison to the Chief of Space Operations and the Space Staff and provides advice to the Air Force and Space Force. Major Sfala will speak on the U.S. initiative on the establishment of the U.S. Space Force. The second speaker is Ms. Elina Morozoa. Ms. Morozoa is Executive Director of the Intersputonic International Organization of Space Communications an intergovernmental satellite telecommunication organization headquartered in Moscow, Russia. Ms. Morozova is also an associate editor and core expert of the McGill Manual of International Law applicable to military uses of outer space. She is going to speak Russian initiatives, including no first placement of weapons in outer space and the draft treaty on the prevention of the pre placement of weapons in outer space. The third speaker is Mr. Roland Giselle, who is currently the head of the Arms and the Conduct of Hostilities Unit at the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Mr. Giselle was posted in various conflict areas for several years and then served as diplomatic advisor to the ICRC presidency since 2008. Mr. Giselle worked in the ICRC legal division Mr. Giselle is speaking on the views on, of the ICRC on the international law, inter, militarization of outer space. The fourth speaker is Professor Dale Stephens. Professor Stephens is a professor of law 
at the University of Adelaide Law School. He's currently director of the Adelaide Research Unit of Military Law and Ethics and co-editor of the Umela Manual on the International Law of Military Space Operations. He's speaking on the current efforts to draft the Umela Manual on the International Law of Military Space. So the panelists will speak and uh, Major Sfala, the floor is yours. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel discussion. Uh, before I begin, I note that the views presented are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense and the Department of the Air Force. So while working uh, at the Pentagon, I've been closely involved in the establishment effort of the newest US Armed Force, the United States Space Force, in its first year of existence. So I'll focus primarily on this initiative, followed by the distinction between the US Space Force as a service and the similarly named combatant command, and finish with a discussion of US regulation of space. Uh, I'll begin with discussing why the Space Force was established. Uh, there are plenty of jokes out there about the Space Force, uh, many of which I appreciate myself. Um, there's also some concern that the establishment of the Space Force marks a US transition to a more aggressive stance in space. Uh, but I first want to emphasize that the US has consistently expressed the goal of preserving space for peaceful uses and exploration in accordance with our international obligations. The establishment of the Space Force does not change this stance. But it's important first to differentiate between the militarization of space and the weaponization of space. Space has been militarized since the beginning of the space age. The militarization of space is nothing new, but the weaponization of space is an entirely different matter and an arms race in space is not in the interest of anyone. Therefore, US efforts are aimed at preventing conflict and aggression from extending into space. The challenge that we face is that US competitors in space have been developing and testing space capabilities that threaten our space assets and interests, some of which we rely upon for everyday use, such as the GPS system. Therefore, we are preparing prudent defensive measures in the feasible event that we are threatened or attacked. Another challenge is that space has become more congested and competitive with more objects and actors, lower cost of entry with new technology and privatization adding to the complexity. Therefore, there's a need to improve upon our space situational awareness and to protect our shared environment from future harm. The Space Force aims to address these challenges by consolidating space organizations and resources that were previously spread out among the other branches of the military into a single branch exclusively dedicated to the development of space capabilities and space professionals. As an independent military branch, the Space Force now has its own dedicated budget. The Space Force can independently advocate for its interests and space is now acknowledged in the US as its own military domain, independent yet well integrated and supportive of all the other military domains. It's important to understand that the Space Force is established in US law. There is this perception that Space Force is solely a product of the Trump administration. However, the groundwork and interest in creating an independent Space Force has been around for some time. The most recent effort began when former President Trump signed Space Policy Directive 4 in February of 2019. This directed the Department of Defense to develop a legislative proposal to establish the Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. The legislative proposal was drafted by the Department of Defense and submitted to Congress. It passed both houses of Congress and was signed into law in December of 2019. So there are now two services within the Department of the Air Force, the Air Force and the Space Force, all under the Secretary of the Air Force. And some have asked about the future of the Space Force, particularly with a new administration. Our existing space policies and strategies are certainly subject to review and alteration by the new administration. 
However, since the Space Force is established in law, any structural changes would require congressional action. Next, I'll explain the differences between the US Space Force, the military service, and US Space Command, the newest combatant command. US, first, a little history. US Space Command was initially established in 1985. It later merged with US Strategic Command and then was reestablished as the 11th Combatant Command in mid-2019. So as a military service, the Space Force is responsible for organizing, training, and equipping space troops. In simpler terms, this means that military services buy things and train troops on how to use them and then supplies these troops and assets to the combatant commands. As a combatant command, U.S. Space Command is authorized to conduct space operations within its area of responsibility, which is 100 kilometers above mean sea level. And I'll return to that point in a moment. So in contrast, the Space Force as a military service is not authorized to conduct space operations. And what do I mean by space operations? This does not mean boots on the moon, uh, despite what you may have seen on Netflix. Uh, rather, space operations primarily consist of watching over and defending our space assets that are in orbit, and also using our space assets in orbit to support military operations on Earth. I should also mention that uh, US Space Command area of responsibility is not an attempt to legally define or delineate outer space, rather it is only intended to clearly define an operational area of responsibility. <clears throat> uh, next, I will discuss the organizational design of the Space Force. Uh, the Space Force was not built from the ground up with brand new mission sets and organizations. Rather, the majority of our efforts over the past year have involved taking existing organizations, primarily within the Air Force, renaming them, restructuring them, and realigning them to the Space Force. <clears throat> These organizations will continue to form the same missions they did in the Air Force, but now in the Space Force. As an example, the Space Force has recently taken over operation of the satellite-based GPS system, which is used by billions of people worldwide for communications, aviation, travel, and financial transactions. The organizational design of the Space Force is unique from the other branches. Currently, there are only 2,900 service members compared to over 300,000 in the Air Force. The intent going forward is to remain lean and agile. In order to do so, the Space Force has removed two layers of bureaucracy from its chain of command. And the goal here is to increase efficiency and streamline processes, particularly when it comes to acquiring, developing, and fielding space capabilities. The Space Force will maintain its lean structure and reduce costs by receiving about 75% of its support functions and infrastructure from the Air Force. So Air Force lawyers like myself, doctors, civil engineers, et cetera, will continue to provide support functions to space units and space missions. <clears throat> it's been over uh, 73 years since the US established a new military service. So much of the first year was spent designing the organization and establishing the Space Force's unique culture. And I anticipate the next few years being dedicated to better integrating the Space Force with the Department of Defense, other federal agencies, the commercial industry and our international allies and partners. So the establishment of the new service the reestablishment of the combatant command, as I mentioned, do not signify a change to the US regulatory framework in space, but is rather a response to an environment of increasing threat and congestion in space. So 
So U.S. military operations in space will uh, continue to be conducted in compliance with our international legal obligations, which include the UN Charter, the four UN space treaties, including the Outer Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, the Rescue Agreement, and the Registration Convention. Domestically, our military space operations have been and continue to be largely regulated by departmental directives and are guided by joint doctrine. In addition, just over the past year, the former administration released a new national space policy. The Department of Defense released its defense space strategy. And the Space Force released its capstone doctrine publication entitled Space Power. These framework documents are publicly available online. And more broadly, the US remains intent on working with allies and partners to develop commonly accepted and responsible behaviors in space. And just to conclude, uh, the US has long maintained the goal of promoting responsible behaviors in space. The creation of an independent space force has the capacity to strongly support this objective with the ultimate goal of preserving and sustaining space for future activity and for the benefit of all nations. And I believe that's probably all the time I have. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak on the panel. Thank you very much, Major Sfara. So the next speaker is Ms. Elina Morozova. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our participants of this virtual room. I would like to share some initiatives which are undertaken by Russia, uh, which are aimed at preventing militarization of outer space and similar as uh, the US, uh, as we have just heard uh, from Major Esfara, uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia from the very beginning of the space age have been promoting uh, that the use of outer space must be for peaceful purposes. And more so in 1958, just one year after the launch of the first artificial satellite, the Soviet Union made a proposal at the United Nations that uh, the use of outer space for military purposes must be banned. Of course, we all now know that um, uh, the history shows another avenue and uh, uh, military space applications are widely used by uh, different nations to support their uh, defense and security activity. Uh, but uh, as we also know, the Outer Space Treaty uh, settles uh, uh, the use of weapons of mass destruction. It is prohibited, uh, very clear, and the question of other weapons in uh, space uh, remained open. And in this regard, it was uh, about 40 years ago when the Soviet Union for the first time uh, requested that a draft treaty prohibiting any weapons in outer space was included in the agenda of the UN General Assembly. And um, in a couple of years, um, a bit later, the Soviet Union added another suggestion to the General Assembly uh, that uh, there should also be a treaty on prohibition of the use of force in outer space and from space against the Earth. And that treaty uh, suggested that uh, any testing and deployment of all types of weapons would be prohibited at, and that uh, all then existing weapons which can be used against satellites would be destroyed and that states undertook obligation not to create uh, new weapons. No progress was achieved with regard to these two draft treaties, which were introduced in 1981 and 1983, but uh, the idea was not abandoned. And uh, more so, we saw its reincarnation in 2008, I mean exactly um, a PPWT. It was um, uh, the Conference of Disarmament as uh, the platform for introducing this draft treaty on prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space and of the threat or use of force against outer space objects. And the suggestion was made jointly by Russia and China. Uh, later in 2014, this uh, suggestion was amendment, uh, amended to include uh, comments uh, made by other states. And uh, as the title suggests, the treaty 
is aimed at preventing the placement of any types of weapons in outer space and to prohibit any resort uh, to the threat or use of force against outer space objects. The draft treaty also uh, defines what uh, should be understood by weapons in outer space and this definition includes any space object or um, its component part which is either produced or converted to destroy, damage or uh, disrupt any uh, normal functioning of space objects or um, uh, cause damage to human beings or to the biosphere which is important for their lives. And uh, though negotiations of the PPWT are uh, to a great extent supported at the UN General Assembly level, uh, states are unable to agree upon the program of uh, work for the Conference of Disarmament. So the work of this international forum has actually been blocked. Uh, still, Russia continues to argue that uh, the Conference on Disarmament is the important forum to negotiate a multilateral, um, legally binding agreement on the prevention of the use of force. But in the meantime, there is another uh, Russia's initiative which is uh, implemented to prevent militarization of outer space. Uh, Russia encourages states to uphold a political commitment not to be the first to place weapons in outer space. And uh, this initiative is uh, also not a new one. As early in 1983, during the reception of a U.S. delegation in the Kremlin, the USSR leadership uh, took a commitment um, not to place anti-satellite weapons in outer space. And uh, much later, in 2004, at the UN General Assembly, Russia extended uh, this political commitment to any weapons in outer space. And since then, we are encouraging other states to follow this example. Um, as of now, uh, there are about 30 nations uh, which um, upholded this commitment. Generally, it is set out in a joint statement between the obligating state and uh, uh, Russia. Uh, and over uh, several uh, recent years, the General Assembly annually adopted a resolution titled uh, in the same manner, so no first placement of weapons in outer space. And uh, according to this resolution, uh, uh, such a measure is important uh, while a legally binding agreement on prevention of an arms race in outer space is not uh, concluded. And um, interestingly, the US constantly votes against uh, NVP resolution and the main criticism uh, which uh, is really uh, uh, relevant to both NFP and uh, PPWT relates uh, first to the notion of uh, space weapons. Uh, according to the US, uh, this notion is not adequately uh, defined. And this is the very first uh, big difference between the approaches uh, in the US and Russia's position, as I can see them. Uh, it seems that Russia tries to um, solve uh, this problem uh, with regulation of objects like space weapons. And it seems that the U.S. approach is more focused on regulating activity. Um, uh, this is probably why the U.S. and um, its allies widely supported a recent U.K. initiative at the UNJ. Uh, resolution, which was titled Reducing Space Threats Through Norms, Rules and Principles of Responsible Behavior. So the focus is on behavior, not on the objects. Another concern of the U.S. was that um, there are no features that can make it um, possible to in fact effectively confirm that uh, states comply with NFP or uh, PPWT. And finally, both initiatives are criticized for being silent on terrestrially based anti-satellite weapons. And this is another major difference in the approaches of Russia and the US. Russia has historically been focused on threats which come from space to the Earth, 
while the U.S. has always been concerned about its space assets being threatened, threatened from the Earth. Um, as a brief conclusion, um, uh, I think we all agree that uh, the problem of the militarization of outer space exists, and uh, this is also recognized by the majority of states. At the same time, significantly, uh, significantly different approaches have prevented these states from uh, solving this problem for decades, and under such circumstances, there is a risk uh, that complex situations in space may occur. And uh, in this regard, any other means aimed at preventing such situations and uh, minimizing their consequences should be promoted and supported. So I very much look forward to our panel's further discussion on this matter. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Molodova. So then, well, from here, it's more international humanitarian law. And the third speaker is Mr. Giselle. Mr. Giselle, you have the floor. Please. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. Good morning, good afternoon to all the viewers who join us. Let me first thank the American Society of International Law for inviting me to provide the perspective of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, on the use of weapons in outer space. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. As many of you will know, a core aspect of our mandate is to promote and strengthen respect for international humanitarian law, or IHL, also known as the law of armed conflicts. Among others, we follow the development of means and methods of warfare, those based on new technologies or they use in new domains such as outer space. Our assessment encompasses the interrelated legal, military, technical, ethical, and humanitarian considerations. And we focus on the foreseeable humanitarian impact of new technologies of warfare and the challenges that they may pose to existing IHL rules. Today, I will first share some concerns regarding the humanitarian consequences of the potential use of weapons in outer space then summarize the applicable legal framework, and finally highlight some relevant challenges. So let me start by the potential humanitarian consequences of the use of weapons in outer space. Despite the long-time aspirations of the international community for the peaceful use of outer space and numer numerous UN resolution and processes, many of which recalled by Ms. Mozorova, Space has become a new theater for geopolitical competitions between major spacefaring powers, including in the military domain. This has notably been fueled by an increasing use of space technologies for military operations, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, command and control systems, drones, missile warning systems, precision guided munitions, all heavily rely on space-enabled technology. But the number, variety and breadth of civilian activities that rely on space-enabled technologies is also very extensive and growing by the day. Navigation satellite systems are increasingly employed in civilian vehicles, shipping and air, control, air traffic controls. The global financial systems and many electricity grids rely on GPS atomic clocks. Satellites are also critical for weather services used for disaster prevention, and satellite phone services may be necessary to the delivery of emergency humanitarian assistance. So disruptions of space assets would have highly negative effects for civilian lives on Earth. Second, we all know that debris is an increasing concern for space operations, in particular peaceful space operations. Now imagine the exponential effect of space kinetic military operations during conflict in terms of the creation of space debris, they could remain in orbit for decades or more. Given the speed at which debris travel, they could damage other satellites, including those supporting civilian activities and services. So let me turn to my second part. What does the law have to say about it? Let me first recall the basic. Any and every military activities in outer space is constrained by existing international law. Of most relevance for all purpose are the United Nations Charter, Outer Space, and International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. First, the UN Charter prohibits the threat or use of force between states, 
with the very exception narrow we all know. The Charter also mandates the states to settle the dispute by peaceful means. These prohibitions and obligations extend to outer space like anywhere else. The Outer Space Treaty itself recognized the common interest of all humankind in the use of outer space for peaceful purposes and requires that celestial bodies be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. For chair and the two excellent panelists before me already recalled it, that outer space must be used for peaceful purposes, purposes only, and I think this shows the importance of these rules. When it comes to weapons in outer space, Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty prohibits the placement of weapons of mass destruction in orbit, on celestial bodies, or anywhere else in space. It also forbids the establishment of military bases and installations, the testing of any type of weapons, and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies. For its part, international humanitarian law prohibits weapons that are indiscriminate by nature and a number of other type of weapons. These IHL prohibitions are not limited to the terrestrial domain. In the unfortunate event that hostilities were to take place in space, IHL provides clear restrictions on the use of weapons that would not be otherwise unlawful. The principle of distinction, the prohibition against indiscriminate and disproportionate attack, and the obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid incidental civilian harm. More stringent rules protect specific categories of objects, such as those indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. Are there challenges to apply IHL rules to space hostilities? Yeah, there are a number, but let me flag just two of them on the notion of attack and the issue of collateral damage. Some of the IHL rules that I mentioned apply only to attacks. And I'm not talking here of an armed attack under the UN Charter. The notion of attack under international humanitarian law is a different notion. So under IHL, what qualifies as an attack against a satellite or other space system? A kinetic operations, whether through direct ascent or co-orbital, would certainly qualify. But a space system could also be disabled through directed energy weapons or a cyber attack, for instance. In the view of the ICRC, such non-kinetic operations would also constitute attack on the IHL. But what is this loyally debate all about? It's simply that, in our view, it would be prohi prohibited to direct such non-kinetic operations also against civilian satellites, even during an armed conflict. However, civilian satellites and some of their hosted payloads may also be used by the armed forces. And depending on the circumstances, they may become military objectives during an armed conflict. If such a dual-used satellite or its payload is attacked, the expected incidental harm to civilian and civilian objects the collateral damage, as it's sometimes referred to. This must be taken into consideration when assessing the legality of the attack under IHL. And this includes the incidental civilian harm caused indirectly, what we sometimes call the reverberating or cascading effect, provided that such indirect effects are reasonably foreseeable. Disabling the civilian functions of satellite could indeed disrupt large segments of modern day society and the delivery of essential services to civilians on Earth. Let me conclude with two forward-looking considerations. In its nuclear weapons advisory opinion, the International Court of Justice recalled that the established principles and rules of IHL apply, I quote, to all forms of warfare and to all kinds of weapons, including those of the future, end quote. Let me recall in this respect the obligation to review the legality of any new weapons, means, or method of warfare to ensure it can be used in compliance with international humanitarian law and other relevant international law rules, in this case, notably space law. Such weapons legal review are particularly important in light of the rapid development of new technologies of warfare today, including state weapons space weapon that states would decide to develop or acquire, be it kinetic or not, space-based or ground-based. Second, in our view, it would be critical that any future discussion and decision on the weaponization of outer space at national or multilateral level 
acknowledges the potentially significant humanitarian consequences of the use of weapons in space. As with the development of any new means and method of warfare, the weaponization of outer space is not inevitable. It's a choice. States may very well agree on additional rules to prohibit or limit specific military activities or weapons in outer space for a range of reasons, such as to reduce the risk of humanitarian consequences for civilians on Earth. So let's hope that the potential humanitarian consequences from the weaponization of outer space can be averted and that all skies remain a province for all humankind to enjoy peacefully. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Giselle. So our last speaker is Professor Dale Stephens. Please we'll proceed to your speech, Professor. Thank, thank you, Professor Aoki, and thank you to the American Society of International Law for this opportunity to talk uh, on the topic of the Woomera Manual. I start by observing that we are to some extent in the age of the manual. We've had in the 1990s the San Remo Manual on Naval Warfare, in the 2000s the Harvard Manual on Air and Missile Warfare, and the 2010s the Tallinn Manual on Cyber Warfare. And I'm talking in the uh, 2020s about the, the Woomera Manual. What is it? It's a manual that uh, seeks to objectively articulate and clarify existing international law applicable to military space operations. It's headed by four uh, universities, the University of Adelaide, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the University of Exeter in the UK, and the University of New South Wales, Canberra, with the ICRC as an observer, the Secure World uh, Foundation and Union of Concerned Scientists sending uh, representatives, and other academics and government lawyers participating all in their personal capacity. It's a manual that uh, is subject to peer review and state engagement. We hope to publish it in uh, late this year or early next year. It focuses on three key areas, peacetime military operations, military operations in a time of potential rising tension, and then uh, armed conflict. The methodology relies heavily on state practice to inform meaning and understanding uh, applicable customary international law. Such uh, preference on state views is taken, uh, in, um, is, is taken in preference to the views of academics who, under the uh, statute of the International Court of Justice, of course, uh, rep have, a, have a subsidiary uh, status in terms of informing international law development. The Woomera Manual deals with existing technology, such as satellites and, and other existing spacecraft, but looks to the future, about 20 years into the future, anticipating humanity's settlement on other celestial bodies, such as the moon, Mars and asteroids, and foresees activities such as resource extraction, which may be a cause for international security concern. The basic premise is that states make international law. We know that. Uh, state practice in particular, as I said, guides our, our thinking and the development of an articulation of rules and commentary. State practice, of course, is a component of opinio juris for customary international law, but equally significant under Article 31.3b of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which talks about subsequent state practice informing treaty meaning. And we rely on that um, very heavily. The ILC, of course, International Law Commission, has spoken about what constitutes state practice um, in their multi-year study. Practice can include official statements concerning treaties meanings, protests, non-performance, tacit consent to statements and silence. All of that uh, has legal significance, which we are uh, interested in, in uh, locating and articulating. How might this apply? Uh, the Outer Space Treaty, of course, is a, is a short treaty, a, a short treaty that deals with the universe, um, but their provisions, of course, have great impact. Article 9, of course, is, a, is an example of where we would look at state practice. Uh, it talks about uh, states that are engaging in potentially harmful interference, um, engaging in appropriate consultations uh, before proceeding to such activity. We have, as been mentioned by some of the other speakers, we've had instances of uh, ASAT tests from the Earth to space, China in 2007, the USA in 2008, India in 2019, uh, launching missiles to destroy their own satellites to prove capability. 
Um, that's very uh, relevant in terms of legal significance because while there were protests that came out as a result of these tests, no state anywhere said that this was a violation of Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which to us um, has legal significance in terms of the threshold for how Article 9, in this instance, uh, might be interpreted. Similarly, instances of jamming or spoofing uh, satellites uh, and the, and the non reaction in terms of Article 2.4 of the Charter has, by states, has legal significance. It's been mentioned that uh, space law comprises five treaties um, uh, and, uh, and customary international law is the starting point. The other methodological issue that you need to grapple with is how do you, how do you reconcile those treaties with other bodies of international law? And are you allowed to do that? Well, Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty says you're allowed to do that and applies international law generally uh, to space. So that raises questions. Which law applies to, to dictate uh, the legality or not of, of space activities? In this regard, again, the International Law Commission has been quite helpful with its study on the uh, impact of armed conflict on, uh, on treaties. Now, of course, armed conflict is the extreme uh, end of, uh, of activity in space, but nonetheless, their, their findings are quite helpful. The, the idea is that all treaties apply to space, uh, all, all treaties apply um, in an armed conflict or leading up to an armed conflict, um, and you need to reconcile obligations under all of those, under all of those treaties. But then the question is, what happens when this isn't possible, uh, when you can't do that? And the ILC have been quite um, illuminating in stating that when that happens, rights like Article 51 of the UN Charter, rights of self-defence, have precedence and other treaties must yield to that, uh, to that precedence to the extent that that is necessary. The ILC have also observed that the, that the, the international humanitarian law, which uh, Mr Gissel uh, spoke about, has precedence, is the lex specialis in all circumstances uh, where you have armed conflict. Now, that doesn't mean that it always displaces um, prevailing law, other prevailing law, the return of astronauts under the Rescue and Return Agreement and the Third Geneva Convention regarding prisoners of war is an example where you might satisfy both. You have an obligation to return uh, astronauts, even belligerent uh, military members who would be otherwise prisoners of war, but you can do that under the Third Geneva Convention when they return under parole. So it is a possibility it's a possibility that you can comply with both uh, regimes. In terms of the issues, let me just outline some that we're looking at in terms of space, the non-appropriation uh, principle, which is, which is fundamental to the Outer Space Treaty, is, is a guiding principle, but we are going to have settlements and mining activities on celestial bodies, and there are going to be security implications. So how do you deal with that? At present, Articles 8, 9 and 12 of the OST seem to cover that to some extent, but there's going to be dispute. There's going to be uh, ambiguity. Uh, Article 6 and non-state entities is a real big issue given the strict liability type uh, state responsibility that attaches to non-state entities. And that is problematic in terms of, of, of ad bellum and in bello issues because you don't want companies going out there plunging your state into armed conflict. Restrictions on military activities, which some of the uh, former speakers have, have spoken about, Clearly, they exist in un, under Article 4, but what is actually permitted? Article 4 only deals with specific prohibitions. Use of force, what is a use of force in space? Jamming, spoofing, temporary measures seem to be tolerated. Uh, when do you have an armed attack? Scale and effect, old weather satellites versus early warning satellites. Is there a difference? I think there is. Uh, cyber and effects, direct energy weapons, co-orbital ASATs, all of this requires deep uh, analysis based on state practice, principally informing meeting. And, and let me end uh, it, it, with this, a, a comment, and I echo uh, Laurent's comments about IHL. IHL applies to space, and there is some theoretical issue, some theoretical point views that it doesn't, but it does. Um, but how does it apply? It needs, there is a lot of uh, IHL that is theatre specific. So the goal is to find what can apply more generally to, to space and to deal with different, not just law, but laws of physics in space and how that, how that might uh, apply. Proportionality, precautions. But I have a feeling that other uh, less, less uh, 
starring roles in the Geneva Conventions like Constant Care and Warnings, which don't get a lot of play here on Earth, are going to have much more uh, prominence when we look at potential armed conflict in space, God forbid. And let me just end that we uh, we are in the age of the manual, not because they are determinative, but because they, they uh, provide a starting point for discussion. Um, the Woomera Manual seeks to promote uh, uh, that discussion by articulating the, the law. The goal, we all agree, everybody must agree, is to avoid strategic miscalculation and to ensure that peaceful activities, including peaceful military activities, can continue while ensuring security for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Stephens. So, well, all four speakers have, well, completed their speech. And uh, I'm going to give, well, I'm going to ask, uh, well, all of you one question. And uh, after that, if time allows, I hope, well, you will make a comment and the questions each other. And uh, the order is also from uh, Major Sfara to, well, in the end, Professor Stephens. And uh, to Major Sfara, I have a question. Well, I'm, uh, according to your explanation, for the first time, I understand the difference from between space com and the space force. Thank you very much about that. And then, could you elaborate a little bit more on what are important rules or norms to maintain peaceful uses of outer space, please? This is a question for you. <laughs> Uh, so there seems to be agreement that weaponization is the biggest threat to the peaceful use of space. Uh, in my view, it's not militarization because space has always been military or has been militarized for decades. Um, I can't say that the U.S. as previously mentioned is intent on cooperating with allies and partners to develop non-binding but commonly accepted and responsible behaviors in space uh, that are then complemented by our national space policies and regulations. Uh, one example of this is the US recognizes the need to limit new and mitigate existing or space debris. Uh, in line with this effort, the US, all US space activities must comply with the US government orbital debris mitigation standard practices, which were updated and strengthened in 2019 the goal here is to encourage other nations to follow suit as some already have. Uh, the U.S. also continues to support uh, voluntary adherence to the ongoing transparency and confidence building measures in outer space activities. Uh, we see this as a pragmatic and near term approach to maintaining peace. And finally, uh, the U.S. State Department has expressed the US, that U.S. may consider arms control measures if they are justifiable and verifiable. By justifiable, I mean the measures uh, enhance national security of the U.S. and su sufficiently address the greatest threats to space assets, such as terrestrial base anti-satellite weapons. Um, by verifiable, I mean the practicable ability to monitor ver and verify the placement of weapons in space. And an open ongoing debate is whether such a verification regime is even feasible. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. And uh, to... Ms. Morozova, well, you explained very pertinently that the diff well, difference between Russian stance and the uh, U.S. stance and uh, the difficulty, well, the, there's a difficulty between behavior-based and uh, weapon-based approaches. And, well, it's a very difficult question, but do you think there is a possibility to make some arrangement, a compromise to produce a reasonable result, including some TCBM measures as a first step or something? And also, well, well, for you, only for you, two questions, not two questions, or well, I request you to talk a little bit about the uh, Miramos project and the uh, Miramos rules, because this would be very relevant to Umela project as well. So please, Ms. Morozova. Thank you, Professor Oki, for these questions, uh, two in one hand. Uh, okay, I'll try to cover them uh, quickly. So first, I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, all nations have the same interests. And um, it was said for a number of times from this panel speakers and all over the globe, uh, if we would like to have uh, outer space sustainable, 
uh, and if we have to, uh, we have to uh, somehow agree on basic uh, principles. And TCBMs, uh, which you have mentioned as an example, um, a really good example because uh, this group of experts included uh, some 15 states, including the US and Russia, and they managed to produce and a result which can be useful um, in uh, this um, particular field. But of course, we can witness a lack of um, detailed rules uh, which can prohibit the either space weapons or certain type of behavior. And uh, in such circumstances, any other source uh, would be very much useful. And uh, I have met an old Professor Stevens mentioned that it would be a starting point for discussion. So I think uh, such types of manuals uh, at the very beginning, it is already absolutely great that they open a discussion. They open a transparent and frank discussion among um, different experts all over uh, the globe. And um, uh, of course, uh, all experts participate in such uh, uh, international projects in their personal capacity, but we are not people from nowhere. We come from our countries with certain background and uh, we try to at least to explain our approaches. So these manuals, uh, whether Mila Moss or Boomera, will be very much helpful, helpful to describe at least the variety of views if we do not have a uh, universal view on this or that uh, issue. It will help to tailor uh, the behavior of states and uh, to make it uh, more predictable and more transparent. So this is my trust placed in such manuals. Thank you very much, Ms. Elina Morozova. And uh, to Mr. Giselle, well, I have a question about the well, total applicability of international humanitarian law to outer space. Well, let, let me elaborate a little bit more because uh, there is no international armed conflict have been taken in outer space and also the different physics of uh, space. Well, at this moment, well, virtually, substantially, no people live there. So this kind of difference, do you think, have impact on thinking about uh, considering the rules of IHL rules for well hostilities conduct and the other rules. So could you elaborate a little bit more about that and where is the best well, or second best venue to think about the IHL rules to well to mitigating the humanitarian consequences in the future. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair, to allow me to elaborate a little bit on that. So on your first question, with regard to uh, uh, whether there are challenges to apply the rules of IHL in outer space because of uh, the different physics over there, notably, or other reasons, uh, uh, they might be issues with some specific rules, for example, those which are developed for specific domains. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the rules of the law of naval warfare were developed specifically for naval warfare, and they may not necessarily easily be transferred to outer space, and maybe it should not be transferred to outer space. But a number of other rules of international humanitarian law, uh, for example, as I mentioned, the principle of distinction applies across every domain, everywhere, whether you are in the sea, whether you are in urban warfare, whether you are uh, anywhere else. And uh, they also apply in outer space. And in that respect, uh, the difference in physics doesn't uh, uh, prevent the application of the principle of distinction to take the most easy one. Now, of course, there is some question about how to apply it and how to interpret the rules uh, if ever um, uh, there would be a use of weapons in outer space. And that's uh, uh, useful to think about that. And that's uh, one of the interests of uh, uh, the Woomera project that uh, uh, Professor Stevens just mentioned. And that, as you mentioned, that we're observers. Uh, uh, of, uh, that's indeed the case. And our purpose in being there is to precisely uh, try to uphold and make sure that the manual 
uh, when it applies international humanitarian law for outer space uh, uh, operations, for outer space military operations during armed conflict, that the manual accord the protection that IHL affords to civilians in general, how it's understood in uh, uh, the most known domains of warfare. So there are challenges, but they should not be overstated. And certainly they would not prevent international maintenance law to apply as a body of law. There are plenty of rules which can be applied uh, directly and easily uh, uh, in order to protect civilians uh, uh, from uh, the effects of uh, military space operations. And a last word in that regard is the fact that saying that IHL applies in outer space does not legitimize the use of force or uh, 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 any warfare in outer space. That remains governed by the UN Charter. If it's a use of force that is prohibited by the UN Charter, uh, IHL applies regardless, but that remains prohibited by the UN Charter. The application of IHL changed nothing in that respect. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And for Professor Stevens, Stephens, well, what is the um, most well, urgent and uh, urgent matters to address in IHL applicable to outer space? Well, uh, to outer space military space of uh, military uses of outer space. You've already talked about that, but if you choose one, what is the most urgent matters? Uh, I, it's Sorry. hard to think, uh, I mean, the law of armed conflict is enormous. Um, look, I, 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 let me just echo uh, Mr. Gissell's uh, comments. I think the challenge is, um, is finding uh, not so much that the law applies, it does, but, but how it applies in the unique circumstances of, of space. Distinction applies, but, but how does it apply in, in those circumstances? My feeling, as I mentioned in my talk, is that there are other principles, uh, warnings, uh, um, uh, constant care, indis uh, objects indispensable to the survival of the, of the civilian population. I mean, there's a different meaning for that, I think, in space than what there would be on Earth. Things like oxygen and return rockets and, and things like that in the future are going to loom large. And I think our challenge is to acknowledge the, 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 unique, the unique nature of space, unique nature of human activities in space in an armed conflict and to uh, correspondingly uh, be creative in applying the law to, as Mr. Gissell uh, mentioned, to preserve uh, the rights of civilians and those that, that have those rights under the law of armed conflict. And well, time. I wanted you to talk. Well, thirty minutes. The last word for well, each of you from Major Safara. Oh, no, thirty seconds. Last word. Thanks, ma'am. I just want to note uh, in closing uh, that the United States and the Department of Defense recognize mm -hmm. both Lumera and Milamos as important projects and. Uh, the Air Force Judge Advocate General uh, has supported participation in both of these projects by members of the Air Force JAG Corps uh, in their personal capacities. So mm. you support the, these efforts in that fashion and I'll hand it back to the other panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Moroza, please. I'm glad to know that um, these projects are um, widely supported by uh, different states and um, I think that if the use and exploration of space should really be for the benefit of all humankind, the uh, greater role should be uh, placed in um, the community, whether academic or a civilian, and uh, we should uh, try to start this discussion between the states if they, for some reasons, can't have reached an agreement yet. Thank you. So, Mr. Giselle, please. Thank you. That allows me to answer your second questions as a way of concluding remarks on where those discussions should take place. That's, of course, for states to decide what is the most appropriate forum uh, where to have those discussions. There are many, but it's, of course, for states to decide. What is important from our perspective is that wherever they uh, have those discussions is that they acknowledge uh, uh, the uh, potential humanitarian consequences of the use of weapons in outer space, the potential humanitarian consequences for civilians on Earth, and they recognize that international humanitarian law already impose limits on what can be done in this respect.
Thank you. So, Professor Stefans, please. Thank you, Professor Oki. I get the last word. I, I don't mm. often have that opportunity in my home, so I'm, I'm glad to have that here. Um, my, my comment would be uh, in 30 seconds. I, I agree with Ms. Morozova. I think uh, I have a naval background. I was a naval officer, and we've had decades of navies talking to each other about the law, about procedures, about avoiding miscalculation when encountering each other on the sea. Those conversations must take place in terms of military operations in space. And if the Woomera Manual and the Milamos Manual can assist in, in, um, in sparking those conversations or help or inform those conversations, I think that is, uh, that is a, a fantastic outcome uh, for those two manuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So today, well, although it is um, well, reality that uh, militarization with outer space is in, increasing and uh, enhanced uh, due to the geopolitics reasons and uh, due to the development of technology, there is also law, international space law and IHL, which can be applicable to present the situation. And uh, today, I've, we, we've come to know that the compromise agreement and hope will be there. And law is always applicable. Law plays a pivotal, important law for maintaining and promoting military uses about, not only military uses about outer space and uh, well, all uses of outer space for which is um, which is um, domain for all mankind. So, well, this is a wonderful panel and uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry for my, my bad management of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.